Madam President. Majority Leader. Madam President, first woman president pro tem of the United States Senate. Earlier this morning, we lost a giant in the Senate. Senator Dianne Feinstein was one of the most amazing people who ever graced the Senate, who ever graced the country. She had so many amazing, wonderful qualities wrapped up in one incredible human being. She was smart. She was strong. She was brave. She was compassionate. But maybe the trait that stood out most of all was her amazing integrity. Her integrity was a diamond. Her integrity shone like a beacon across the Senate and across the country for all to see and hopefully emulate. Dianne Feinstein would typically say, when you asked her how was she voting on something, let me study this issue before taking a position. Let me go home and read on it. And when she came back, if she believed the cause or the vote was right, and vital to many issues she cared about, she not only voted for it, there was no stopping her in getting it done. She would take on any force, any special interest, any opponent with, ruth, with relentless integrity and would wear those opponents down until she succeeded. Again, her integrity just shone through them and she won and she won, and she won, and each time made the country a better place. I saw this up close when she passed the assault weapons ban, a passion of hers after what happened to her in California. The NRA was a relentless, often mean-spirited and chauvinistic foe. They oozed vitriol against her, but they didn't scare her, they didn't stop her and they failed against her. Like most of her opponents, they failed against her. Her perseverance, her strength, and most of all, her integrity shone through. I was privileged to carry the bill in the House after she had passed it in the Senate. She guided me every step of the way, and her strength and her integrity strengthened all of us who were fighting that uphill fight. And, and as we went through that bill, it became clear to me, Diane Feinstein is not like the others. She's in a class of her own. Of course, it wasn't just the assault weapons ban she fought for. Her accomplishments also included championing the Violence Against Women Act protecting oversight authority during the investigation into U.S. torture, fighting for climate justice, fighting for marriage equality, fighting for reproductive justice. The list goes on and on. As chair of the Intelligence Committee, Diane fought for what was right, even if it was hard and difficult and took months and years to dig in and find out what actually went wrong. She never stopped. She took on the CIA and asserted Congress's oversight authority during the investigation into United States use of torture. And through all of her accomplishments, this one and all the others, she always displayed the quintessential grace and strength. None of these sons of guns against her ever rattled her. I remember a few years back when a particularly nasty senator tried to put Senator Feinstein down in a, in a condescending, many would say chauvinistic way. She reacted not defensively, but with strength and poise and integrity. And within three minutes, she put this colleague in her place, in his place. And by the end of it, everyone in the room on both sides of the aisle was smiling. That was Diane to a, to a T, powerful, prepared, unflappable. She had to be. Whenever she did something, she was often the first to do it. 
She was elected as the first woman president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, the first woman to serve as mayor of San Francisco, the first woman to serve as U.S. Senator for California, the first woman to chair both the Senate Rules and Intelligence Committees, the first woman member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Our nation will be forever thankful to Senator Feinstein for the accomplishments she fought for. I, too, am personally indebted to Diane, not just as a colleague, which of course I am in so many ways as a colleague, but as a friend and as a father of two daughters. Diane's work extended far beyond the United States Senate floor as she gave a voice, a platform, and a leader to women throughout the country for decades. Diane didn't just put, push down doors that were closed for women. She held them open for generations of women after her to follow her. She gave a voice, a platform, a model for women across the country who aspire to roles in leadership, in public service, who want to leave their own mark on the world, who want to make this country a better place for others. Today, there are 25 women serving in this chamber, and every one of them would admit they stand on Diane's shoulders. So Diane's impact extended far beyond the Senate floor and far beyond politics itself. So today, we grieve. We look at that desk, and we know what we have lost. But we also give thanks. Thanks to someone so rarefied, so brave, so graceful a presence served in this chamber, for so, that someone like that served in this chamber for so many years. In closing, let me just say this. The sign of a leader is someone who dedicates the whole of their spirit for a cause greater than themselves. The sign of a hero is someone who fights for others, who endures for others, no matter the cost, no matter the odds. And the sign of a friend is someone who stands by your side to fight the good fight on the good days and on the bad. Diane Feinstein was all of this and more. A friend, a hero for so many, a leader who changed the nation, sorry, a leader who changed the nature of the Senate and who changed the fabric of the nation, America, for the better. As the nation mourns this tremendous loss, we're comforted in knowing how many mountains Diane moved, how many lives she impacted, how many glass ceilings she shattered along the way. America, America, is a better place because of Senator Diane Feinstein. Today I join with my colleagues in mourning our beloved friend and colleague. Yield the floor. Mr. President. The Republican leader. You know how we all refer to each other as my friend from whatever state it is. Honestly, frequently that's not true. Um, but Elaine and I were actual friends of Dick and Diane. Elaine served on a corporate board with Dick for a number of years. When they were in town together, we would frequently have dinner together. Lane and I got married shortly after the 92 election. And I remember that Diane gave us a small depiction of the Capitol. I looked at it this morning because it's still on the wall and uh, remembered our dear colleague as a truly remarkable individual. As the <clears throat> majority leader has pointed out, she was an incredibly effective person at every line, at every level, and she was at all of those levels on the way to the Senate. Those of us who were fortunate to call Diane our colleague can say we served alongside 
the longest serving female senator in American history. Diane was a trailblazer in her beloved home state of California and our entire nation are better for her dogged advocacy and diligent service. Over the past three decades, the senior senator from California was also the steady hand leading sensitive and consequential work as head of the Intelligence Committee and the Judiciary Committee. Her name became synonymous with advocacy for women and with issues from water infrastructure to counter drug efforts. Of course, the first woman <clears throat> to lead her hometown's Board of Supervisors and then govern as mayor was making history and making a difference long before she came to the Senate. And as much as this institution and the American people will remember Diane's devoted public service, as I indicated earlier, Elaine and I will also remember and cherish a friendship of 30 years we were fortunate to share with Diane and Dick. So today I know the entire Senate family is gathering around Senator Feinstein's loyal staff. Our thoughts and prayers are with Diane's daughter, Catherine, her granddaughter, Eileen, the entire Feinstein, Feinstein family, and with all who mourn our dear colleague and friend. to the Senator, uh, Senate Pro Tem President, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Diane's daughter, Catherine, with Speaker Pelosi in the gallery. Mr. President. The President Pro Tem. Mr. President, yesterday, the senior senator from California came onto the floor through those doors to do her job. She voted. She voted to make sure that our country would continue to move forward and not shut down. That was Diane. She did her job every day. She cared about her country. She cared about her state. She cared about doing a job no matter how tough it is for the future of America. And she did it with dignity and respect every single minute. Today, you will hear accolades from across the country, lists of legislative accomplishments from her early days all the way through her career. What I just want to say today, it is a true loss to America. It is a loss to her family. My heart is with you. It is a loss to her colleagues from California who have served with her and know her as I do, as a tower of strength to our colleagues on the floor who have worked with her on a laundry list of legislation that you will hear about and it's way too long to list today. But to her constituents, you need to know we depended on her just as you did. And she was here every day to fight for you, no matter what. She fought for women. She fought for those who were victims of gun violence. She fought for foreign policy that was remote to most people, but she knew every detail. And when Diane spoke, the rest of us stopped and we listened. Mr. President, she was a friend. I was sworn into office just a few weeks after she was, and she was always there for us in matters big and small, in matters of our country, in matters of policy, and always as a friend. To those of you who don't know, she was the most generous senator I have ever known. I remember one time when I noticed that her purse was really nice, and I said, Diane, that, that purse, it's beautiful. Two days later, I got one delivered to my door. <laughs> that was Diane. She saw people. She knew people. She saw that she could be someone that we all needed, and she saw that she could be there when she was needed and she was there. Mr. President, I will have more to say about my friend of more than 30 years over the next few days, and I'm sure you will hear so much today. 
But Mr. President, I'm so sorry I didn't hug her when she went back out that door yesterday. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. President. The senior senator from Maine. I rise with great sadness today to honor my friend and our colleague, Senator Dianne Feinstein. She was a pioneer and a strong and dignified leader. Diane, who was the longest serving woman in the Senate history, had a career marked by many firsts. First woman to serve as mayor of San Francisco. First woman senator to represent California. First woman to serve as the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee and the first woman to serve on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Diane was such a strong presence in the Senate. She was a determined and tenacious advocate. Many of us worked closely with her on the Intelligence Committee where she was such an excellent chairman. She was always fair, respectful, informed, and strong. We worked together on the Appropriations Committee as well, where she chairs, chaired the Energy and Water Subcommittee. Many of us were her allies on the Violence Against Women Act and the Respect for Marriage Act. The Senate and the country has lost a model senator. Elegant, graceful, kind, compassionate, strong, informed, intelligent. Mr. President, I have also lost a dear friend. I have put up this watercolor painting that Diane did and gave me so many years ago. It has hung in my office ever since, and it will have a place of honor there always. Every time I would pass by, I would look at it and think about how talented Diane was in so many different areas. I treasured this painting. When I became engaged 11 years ago, it was Diane who sponsored a reception for me and my now husband, Tom Daffron, in her home in Washington. My story is very similar to that of the Republican leader. I was also reminded when I heard Senator Murray talk about Diane's generosity. At one point, one year, she bought seersucker suits for every woman who was serving in the Senate so that we could all participate in Seersucker Tuesday. That was Diane. She paid attention to the smallest details, to the largest issues that affected not only our country and the world. Most of all, Diane was such a role model for girls and women. She was a role model for us who came to the Senate after she began her storied tenure here. I will miss Diane terribly. My heart goes out to her family, and may she rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the majority whip. Mr. President, today we mourn the death of a trailblazer, my colleague and friend, Senator Dianne Feinstein. I have been known, I have been privileged to have known Diane throughout her entire career in this chamber. 
and my entire time as well. She was my friend and seatmate on the Senate Judiciary Committee for over 20 years. When you're that close to someone, politically, day in, day out, week in, week out, you pick up on the things that mean the most to, to her. Certainly her family was the highest priority to her over all things. But her life experience created what we know as the legacy of Diane. How many times she told the story of serving on the Pardon and Parole Board for the state of California. Cases that she remembered in detail that occurred decades ago that stuck with her and inspired her when it came to her service on the Senate Judiciary Committee. I think that situation also inspired her when it came to legislation where she was looking for fairness. We certainly all know her efforts in dealing with the Violence Against Women Act. That was an extraordinary effort by her on a bipartisan basis with Senator Murkowski, Senator Collins, Senator Ernst, Senator Patty Murray, and so many others. In addition to that, she recounted many, many times that terrible, unimaginable tragedy when the mayor of San Francisco was killed, along with Harvey Milk, a commissioner. And she was there at the bloody scene afterwards. She recounted that so many times in the midst of her debates over an assault weapons ban. Think about that assault weapons ban. It is almost the holy grail in politics. So many people have said that's the one thing we absolutely have to do. It has to be done. She did it. She, along with Senator Schumer, who was then a House member, put together the bill that established an assault weapons ban and reduced the number of deaths in America by gunfire. They did it. And she was a leader, inspired by the terrible tragedy with Mayor Moscone. I can also remember there was a time years ago when we engaged in the debate in this chamber on stem cell science and biology. It was a complicated debate. Many of us liberal arts lawyers were lost uh, as they went into the detail. Diane not only led that debate, she mastered the subject. And time and again in the caucus, when we would discuss it, she would be the one to stand up and straighten everyone out on the basics. She was a gifted person in that regard. But I do want to say there's one thing that Senator Collins noted that I noted many times. Members of the Senate in the committee hearings are given a notepad in front of them. The Senate Judiciary Committee is no exception and a pencil nearby to make notes in the course of our business. Sitting next to Diane all those years, I can't tell you how many flowers I saw her draw on those notepads. I asked her for one one time, she signed it and I've kept it. But it's an indication of the sweetness and the elegance in her life. That at one hand she could be arguing the most serious life and death issues in the committee, but on the other hand show that kind of dignity and determination to bring the human side to the debate. She was one of the best, and I was honored to call her a friend. There were many times that she made the roll call in the Senate Judiciary Committee in the last year or two, when I know it was an extraordinary sacrifice. She was going to show up because that was her responsibility. I respected her so much for that, and in a committee divided 11 to 10, I needed her, and she knew it, and she was there. She answered the call. She served in California with such distinction. She often talked about her beloved Golden State, but we all know that she was also a treasure to the nation. Dianne Feinstein inspired many, particularly many women, to public service. She served California well and she served our nation. It was my honor to serve with her. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The senior senator from Alaska. Mr. President, there will be many opportunities in the next few days and, and, and weeks following to, to reflect on the life and the contributions of, of Senator Dianne Feinstein. And as has been noted, the, the significant legislation that she advanced over three decades here, um, what that meant to, to her state, to her constituents, really to her country, but also to us. And as I, as I think about the work that we all 
that we all take on here. We know that we are capable of much, but we are made even more capable by extraordinary staff. And one of the things that I have noted over the years is, is the extremely loyal staff that Senator Feinstein had, had built around her. I know that they are grieving today, as, as is Diane's family, uh, so many friends. But I think, I think we, we acknowledge them at this same time of, of this very significant loss of not only a colleague, but of a friend. And I think it's important that people understand that here in the United States Senate, a place that can be so divisive at times, that true friendships actually exist. And whether it is the Republican leader and his wife over the years dining together, or as Senator Collins has stated, just the very generous nature of, of Senator Feinstein sharing, sharing her works, sharing her art, uh, sharing a purse. I still have that seersucker suit. And when we all engage in the annual ritual of donning the seersucker suit, mine is now 20 years old, I think yours is too. But our reality is it is a just a direct reminder of the spontaneous generosity of of a woman. Diane Feinstein was generous, she was gracious, she was thoughtful, she was kind. There were, there were many times when we were looking into a weekend when we were going to be here, and she being from California, me being from Alaska, recognizing that probably neither one of us was going to be making it to that other coast, and she would say, Lisa, let's go to dinner. And sometimes we would just spontaneously make that happen, and other times we would just make the plans. But that was that outreach to do so. And what she did as, as, a, as one of the, the, the female leaders in our women's, women's senators group was she made sure that the dinners that we have that we have engaged in over the years, that those continued. And she'd come up and she said, isn't it about time? we have another dinner. And she would be right, and we would organize it. And it was, again, yet a reminder of what it means to come together uh, as colleagues, yes, but really the more that we can do to build those relationships that make a hard job just a little bit easier. And Diane was able to focus on that in a, in a giving and, again, a very generous, generous way. I think it pained us all. It certainly pained me in, in just these past months to see what I believed to be grossly unfair um, attacks on a woman who was in failing health. And I think for some who would focus on that they would fail to appreciate what this extraordinary woman, what this extraordinary leader had contributed not only to, to the Senate, but again to her state and to her country. And so as we speak of, of the beauty of Dianne Feinstein and all that she gave to this country, I hope we reflect on the words that Senator Murray shared with us, that her commitment to this job, her commitment to the people was so much that she would put her physical health, how she was feeling. Some days we just don't feel like coming in, you know? Senator Feinstein was here. Senator Feinstein was with an institution that she cared about, she cared deeply about it. She wanted to make sure that we were the best of the best and we reflected that. I think she'd actually be really pleased with the resolution about dress. I don't need to go into that on the floor. But Senator Feinstein was a woman who was put together, put together in her presence but in her bearing. And I think, I think she, she wanted to see 
the Senate in a dignified and a respectful manner at all time. As I walked in this morning, I thought she probably wouldn't approve of my shoes, and I'm sorry, Diane. <laughs> but, I, but I share this because I think it demonstrates, again, where the commitment of this woman was. It was to the people that she served, but it was also to an institution that she loved and she dignified with everything that she did right until the end. We have lost an extraordinary woman, and we have lost a friend. But they never leave. They'll always be with us, as will Diane. I yield the floor. Mr. President, the senator from California. <clears throat> Before I... I begin. I also want to acknowledge others that are here in chambers to be uh, part of this tribute, part of this moment, first of many over the coming days and weeks, no doubt. Uh, Senator Schumer acknowledged Speaker Pelosi, excuse me, Speaker Emeritus Pelosi, my speaker, and Catherine in the gallery here. We do have a good amount of the California congressional delegation here as well, paying their respects. The Dean, Representative Lofgren, and so many friends from the north to the south, to the east and the west of the Golden State. Up in the gallery is also Team Feinstein. So many of the staff members that uh, made sure the office was always performing at peak capacity, just the way Diane insisted. I know that personally, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But I think I speak on behalf of all of us when I say that it is with profound sadness that we bid farewell to my dear friend, colleague, an outright champion for the state of California. Senator Dianne Feinstein. As we've been hearing today, she uh, was a towering figure. But let me be clear, she was a towering figure, not just in modern California history, but in the history of our state and our nation. Yes, she broke barriers throughout her career. You've heard about that from Leader Schumer. How many firsts? Her leadership, though, as the city of San Francisco's first female mayor in the aftermath of the tragic assassination of Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk showcased her unique ability to lead with grace and strength in the face of adversity. And it would it be her last time. Following her election to the Senate more than three decades ago, Diane's commitment to bipartisan collaboration made her a deeply respected figure on both sides of the aisle. And so my heart is full to hear the words of Senator Collins and Senator Murkowski and others. She understood the importance of working together to find common ground and to get things done for California, for the country, and most importantly, for the American people. Her ability to bridge divides and find that consensus, especially on the thorniest of issues, was a testament to her dedication to the principles of our democracy and of the many attributes you're hearing about her today. That's the one that I've admired most and have worked my damnedest to try to emulate throughout my career, and especially here in the Senate. Now, long before being able to serve together here in the Senate, 
Diane gave me one of my first jobs in politics in her Los Angeles office at a time early in my career when I was looking to make a difference for my community and for our state. It's in part thanks to her groundbreaking career that a Latino son of immigrants could one day not just work for her, but work alongside her to keep up the fight for the American dream. As we uh, mourn Senator Feinstein's passing, we must also celebrate her incredible legacy, her contributions to our nation, from gun safety and environmental conservation to national security and healthcare reform, and so much more, just as a reminder, not just the power of her example, but the power of public service. For Californians, so much of our public lands have been preserved thanks to her singular drive and leadership. From the redwoods of the Headwaters and the San Francisco Bay, to Lake Tahoe, to the Southern California desert. We can go on and on, but it is clearly, clearly a tremendous impact she's had. She leaves behind the legacy of service, of leadership, and a deep love of our country and our democratic ideals. Um, Senators have mentioned uh, her grace, how she worked, how she carried herself. An example for us to follow. Although uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say there was an exception to that. And that is if you were one of her staff members that came into a meeting with her unprepared. <laughs> you did not want to not have the answer to her question. She was classy, absolutely. We won't get into the debate about the dress code. And as Senator Murray said, she was absolutely generous. Now, I did not receive a seersucker suit. I was not here at the time. But for the decades of a relationship that we had, Every time I came to Washington, I made it a point to reach out at a minimum a call, a lot of times a quick meeting in her office, and I always came away with something. More often than not, it was a book. She has quite a library, right, her collection. Once upon a time, it was a Senate tie. There was always something. And I, too, Senator Collins, have a watercolor. I'm, it's hanging at home in Los Angeles, my wife's favorite. I don't have it here to display. What I do have, though, is a photo, as she said, from back in the day that she sent me just a year ago, periodically going through her files, her archives, a picture from San Francisco AIDS Walk in 1987, but personalized. No auto pen here. Personal note from Senator Feinstein. The last uh, story I'll share which I do think is unique. Another example of her generosity is uh, the day I was sworn into the Senate in 2021, under the most trying of circumstances, COVID, pre-vaccine, two weeks after January 6th. 40,000 National Guards women and men on the perimeter of a fenced-off Capitol complex. She honored me by escorting me down the center aisle to the rostrum, stood behind me as I was sworn in. Big day for me. Tough day not having Angela and my boys by my side. As soon as votes were over, session was over, she grabbed me by the hand. Said, come with me. 
Sorry, not sorry to say that had interviews lined up. We marched right past reporters to her hideaway. We immediately wanted to continue the dialogue of how can I help you? How can I help you? She mustered up a little bit of courage and said, Diane, I love you, but I want to call my wife. <laughs> I've just been sworn into the Senate. So I called my wife. Angela answers. We immediately start FaceTiming each other. We're by the window so we can make sure the signal doesn't drop. And my boys are there. And Diane says, give me the phone. <laughs> I've just been sworn into the United States Senate. And I'm watching. Senator Feinstein FaceTime with my kids. So proud of your dad. When are you coming to Washington? I will buy you lunch. That was Diane Feinstein. May she rest in peace. And may her legacy continue to inspire us all. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Washington. Mr. President, I follow my colleague from California, and I believe he said it correctly, the legacy of Dianne Feinstein. Our colleagues are in shock today, even though we knew Dianne was was ill, even though we knew she was 90 years old, even though we knew she was the longest serving woman senator, the fortitude that she showed and demonstrated was constant. Sitting here just a few months ago in all night Votorama sessions, when the youngest of us would want to crawl into our hideaways and sip coffee at 2 a.m., Diane was at her desk voting. At 90, she had the fortitude, as Senator Murray said, to vote just yesterday. I don't know if it was the steel that was cemented into her at that moment of the mayor's assassination or the tragedy and cost of serving and knowing that you still had to move forward, no matter how disastrous the situation was, Diane moved forward. I am so blessed to have served with her, but I want people to know the nation has lost a legislative giant, women have lost a hero, and the Senate has lost a true colleague. Now, those of us who are out here today know when we say the word true colleague, we mean like true collegial colleague. Sometimes we say the word with a little more disdain, like our frustrating colleague, or as Senator McConnell said, our good friend, when maybe in reality, it's hard to get those words out. But Diane was the epitome of what the Senate is losing. Let's just face it. Diane, one of her most famous phrases was, I have to go home and read tonight. I'll bet you her family or her staff heard her say that because she meant it. She meant, I don't know enough about this subject to go just spur off. I'm literally going to study and analyze and find out what it actually is all about. How many times did Diane stand up in caucus and say, I've been reading a lot about this subject, but I think we need to know a lot more. And she would communicate what she knew, and as many of my colleagues know, she was always asking questions. And for me, as a young uh, member coming here more than 20 years ago, I was amazed and astounded at what I might call 
the polite pushiness of Dianne Feinstein. <laughs> I don't know how she did it, but serving on the Judiciary Committee with her and Dick will observe, when Dianne's time ran out and somebody tried to cut in and debate her, Diane had this way of saying, Mr. Chairman, this is a really important point, and I just need to make this point. And the chairman would let Diane go on for another five minutes. <laughs> and I thought, how does she pull this off? Well, I tell you how she pulled it off, because people knew she was serious about legislating. She was serious about working across the aisle, and probably in my early days here, forged the greatest impression of what working across the aisle was really all about. There were times probably when I didn't even agree with her, but she had the cachet of a senator who could put a deal together with both sides. I saw her great work on the California Desert Protection Act, landmark legislation in protecting California. I saw it on the 2007 energy bill where we raised CAFE standards for the first time in 25 years. Diane had a provision called 10 and 10. She just evangelized every minute of the day about why we needed higher fuel efficiency standards. She thought we could improve it 10 miles in 10 years and she was right and it became the basis of what that bill was and she never let anybody off the hook during those negotiations. She made sure that we got that done. And I saw her work tirelessly, as my colleague, Senator Murkowski, uh, may not have been here yet, but she worked with John Kyle on water legislation until the cows came home, okay, because Arizona and California had real water issues, and Diane was forever adamant about trying to address this issue for the western part of the United States. So for me, I want to thank her family for your sacrifices, for sharing Diane with us, letting us have her as long as she was willing to serve, and for making it the dedication of her life. And yes, that personal side to her was also so sweet. You know, most of us doodle, but Diane doodled in masterpieces. And she was always inviting people to dinner always doing those kind little things for us, which means that you really made the Senate a more human place. That's what she really did. She just made this a more human place by just giving a little time and attention to some of the needs of your colleagues. But what sweet blessings, what sweet stories. I want to honor Diane by remembering her great legacy and thanking thanking all of those who were part of her lives because for women, we didn't really know how to get all of this done here, the, you know, how, how hard you push, how loud you can be, how, how much you can just get in here and grind away sometimes. And Diane showed us that, yes, we could be trailblazers and do it, and that the results really, 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 really matter for people. So I hope that people will remember that legacy of her and, and the kindness that went along with it and realize that this institution really does need to return to the ways of Dianne Feinstein. And if you're from California, you should be damn proud that your senator is gonna go in the history books as a forerunner for so many other women and for policies and behavior that we should be amplifying. I thank the president and I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Minnesota. Mr. President. I first saw Diane, and I see people like the Speaker Emeritus and so many of her friends and family that knew her long before this, Senator Dia, but 1992, the year of the woman, the national convention, my first national convention, young lawyer, and there she was on the stage uh, with Senator Boxer, that groundbreaking, groundbreaking year. And when I think of Diane, as I've heard from my colleagues, 
um, I think about the dignity she brought to this place, about how she would dig into every single issue, the independent thought, the trailblazing. She came into politics as a mayor in the most tragic of circumstances. She was a city council member, there's an assassination, and there she is thrust on the national stage. As Senator Padilla talked about, she always put California first. I remember at one point um, when we were debating, um, speaking out on a national election, and someone said something about um, having the, another candidate having been the mayor of a tough town. And I remember Diane saying, you don't know what a tough town is until you're mayor of San Francisco. The way she would dig into the issues was probably my most memorable moment. She invited me to stay overnight at her house after an event, and I got up early in the morning, and she called me, summoned me into her room. She was sitting up, straight up, with these big fuzzy slippers on, on a Saturday morning, reading a 200-page bill, the Patent Reform Act, and started quizzing me on, we were both on the Judiciary Committee, at the time the only women on the Judiciary Committee, quizzing me on the details of that bill. That was Diane, she did her homework. She came into politics at a time when there weren't many women leaders. And the way that she achieved her goals and passed bills and did what she want was not because she was just, they were gonna just accept her as she was at that moment in time. It was the hard work, it was the relationships, it was the leaderships. And when I heard about the seersucker suit, I had the same experience, I'm brand new in the Senate, don't have much resources, and Diane calls to get my measurements, that actually happened, and got me one of those suits as well. Um, when I talk to young women about them getting involved in politics these days, a lot of them shy away from it, and we still aren't where we're supposed to be with the numbers. And one of the reasons they give is the attacks, they can't handle the negativity. But when I think of Diane, she just kept her head high. I literally think of her posture. She kept her head high. She walked through every storm. Things would fall on the side, but she had a mission. And her mission would be whatever was her responsibility of that day, whether it was the Patent Reform Act, whether it was getting her groundbreaking report done on torture, whether it was the work she did in leading the historic legislation on the assault weapons ban. She kept her head up high and she led. That was her instinct. No matter what happened in this place, no matter what clothes changed, no matter who changed, she always led and we will miss her today. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, I served beside Senator Feinstein on the Judiciary Committee my entire time here, and I worked closely with her on the Intelligence Committee during the time we overlapped there, and I'm honored to join my colleagues in participating in this remembrance to her. Um, it's been said, I think, over and over again of her elegance, as Senator Collins said, of how put together she was, as Senator Murkowski said, of how gracious she was, as pretty much everyone has said. And her preparedness was another standout virtue in this uh, body. Um, I have heard her say, I am going home to read tonight. And serving with her on those committees, I saw over and over again the amount of work that she put herself and her staff through to make sure that she was well prepared. I never saw a member of this body better prepared than Senator Feinstein. But the characteristic that I most associate with her is bravery. Whether it was the bravery of throwing herself into California politics as a young woman at a time when not many women were doing that, or the way she bravely handled the murders at City Hall and her response to that, or whether she was willing to come here when women were few and break glass ceiling after glass ceiling after glass ceiling. 
But the place where I saw her bravery most was when we worked together on the Senate Intelligence Committee torture report. I was kind of Robin to her Batman in that effort. And I still remember her right about where Senator Murray now is, delivering her legendary speech that blew the cover off the CIA torture report. To get there, she had to get through massive counterattacks from the CIA on her and on our Intelligence Committee staff. She had to oppose the Bush administration that was pushing back against her from the very highest levels. And when the administration changed, she had to show the same bravery and the same resistance against pretty much equal pressure from the Obama administration to shut up and go away. Well, shut up and go away were not things that Senator Feinstein was willing to hear. And the moment that she spent on the Senate floor delivering that report was one of the moments that I'm proudest of in the time that I've been here in the Senate. Let me close by talking about her last weeks here, because I think you have to see those last weeks here in the context of her preparation, her determined effort to be as perfect as she could be, and her bravery, because it was not easy for her to come and do the work that she did in those last weeks. But she knew that we needed her. She knew that despite how difficult it was, despite the difficulty she would have in meeting her own standards of perfection, it would have been easy just to go. But she knew that we needed her. We would have lost our majority in the Judiciary Committee without her. And I view her last months and weeks in this body as the last episode of her long career of bravery. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from, the Senator from Hawaii. Over the next uh, days and weeks and indeed months, we're going to hear a lot about our dear friend Diane Feinstein, and I'm so glad that some of her friends from California and uh, speaker, former speaker Nancy Pelosi, her family, are here to, to just uh, be with us in this first moments of our learning of her passing. And we all have stories to tell about Diane, but when I joined, for example, the uh, um, Intel Committee and she was chairing it, she said, Maisie, this is not a committee that you can just parachute in and not spend the time uh, really learning about our intelligence community and, and all that. And I really took that to heart. I spent many, many hours on that committee, even though we could never talk about it. And then one of the earlier uh, hearings uh, in the Judiciary Committee, and I, I, I really uh, marveled at this. It was a hearing that had to do with uh, guns. And, and I always associate, of course, Diane with her courageous fight to uh, ban assault weapons. And one of the newer members of the Judiciary Committee, as I was, chose uh, th that hearing to lecture Diane Feinstein about her advocacy on guns. And I thought this was so untoward uh, against someone who had spent so much of her time fighting for gun safety. But she just said, I have not spent all these years on this committee to be lectured by you, which I thought was um, really quite tactful. But later she said to me, uh, she took me aside and she said, do you think I was too mean? Do you think I should apologize? And all I could think of was, are you kidding? But that was Diane Feinstein. She was old school. She was very kind. And I, uh, I, I am wearing a scarf that she gave to me. And you've heard some of my other colleagues talk about if we admired something uh, of her, she, we, we, she would give it to us. Well, this scarf she was wearing at that moment, and I said, oh, that's such a lovely scarf. And she just took it off and gave it to me. I wear this scarf often. 
In fact, we had to be careful about admiring anything Diane had because she would likely take it off and give it to us. But you know, this is one of the things that I will always remember about Diane Feinstein, her courage, her integrity, her commitment to public service literally until the very, very end. Mr. President, I yield back. Mr. President. The Senator from New Hampshire is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I want to offer my condolences to Diane's family, uh, to her colleagues from California, to the Speaker Emeritus, uh, to my colleague, Senator Padilla, and to so many of our friends and colleagues who are watching uh, today. I wanted to rise just because I'm one of the newer women in the United States Senate, and I wanted to acknowledge the difference that Diane Feinstein's example and work has made for me, for my constituents, for our daughters and our granddaughters. When I came to the Senate, the bipartisan women's dinners were long established. I didn't have to think about how I would get to know my women colleagues and share experiences and learn the ropes from them because Diane Feinstein and her other colleagues who were early pioneers in the Senate had already done some of that work for us. I didn't have to think about whether there was going to be a women's bathroom right off the floor that I could use just the way the men's bath, men use their bathroom in quick moments because Diane Feinstein and others had paved the way. I didn't think, have to think about whether I would be accepted in the same way that Diane Feinstein had to because she had already done that really difficult work of being that much better than everybody else to make sure that she never let women down and that she never let her constituents down. This morning, um, after Senator Murray called us and said we're all going to be on the floor, I was rushing to get ready. And uh, to Senator Murkowski's point, I put on different shoes than I was planning to. They were shoes that Diane had admired. She had the same pair. And uh, she told me they were good ones to wear. Um, I wore a scarf. It's not one Diane gave me, but because I thought Diane would think it would add a little something to my presence today. In the last few months of her service, Diane graced us with her dignity and with her friendship. She had a way of sitting down next to me in caucus lunch and checking in. She knew I had some particular caregiving challenges at home. And she would always say to me, who's with Ben right now? Ben is our son. Um, how are things with the family? I'm not sure people really understand that women still have family responsibilities that aren't easily transferable. She wanted me always to know that we had made a lot of progress, but that there was still progress to make. And in her way of nudging us and being an example for us, she was reminding us that we still have work to do, and she was counting on us to do it. The last meeting that my senior senator and I had with Diane about an issue that was really important to our state and we needed her vote on, she had been home in California recuperating, and she had just made it back to the Senate. And we went to meet with her in her hideaway. And I frankly didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how her health would be. She had a memo. It wasn't a short one. That laid out the entire issue that we were there to talk to her about. She went through that memo several places said, well, I read here that this is the case, and I read there that that is the case. And 
you both are telling me that you think I should vote in a particular way. We went back and forth about a couple of issues. We reinforced our arguments, our belief in why she should vote to support our position. She asked us questions. She knew her stuff. She had read the memo. And she said, for a number of reasons, and she laid them out, that she would vote with us. She had muscle memory that pulled her up to her full height. She had the intellectual discipline and memory to understand how to cut to the chase and make sure she understood the essence of the issue we were dealing with. And she was reminding us of what you're supposed to do to serve your constituents, your state, and your country as the United States Senator. May her memory, Mr. President, be a blessing. I yield the floor. President. The Senator from New York is recognized. I want to thank um, Senator Patty Murray for bringing us all together today. It's a privilege to be on the floor of the U.S. Senate. It's a privilege to serve in the Senate. And it was a privilege to serve with someone as extraordinary as Senator Dianne Feinstein. People know me as a senator who cares deeply about women's rights, about LGBT equality, about children, family, safety, and anything that I've ever cared about, Diane was fighting for long before I was ever in public service. When we talk about public servants who leave legacies, and when we talk about the giants on whose shoulders we stand. For me, that's Diane. She was unlike any senator I met when I first got here in 2009. She had a really incredible combination of elegance, brilliance, stature, certainty, toughness, and kindness. When I first got to the U.S. Senate, I didn't know anything. I was appointed. I hadn't just run a long election where I was telling the constituents of New York why I wanted to serve and what my vision for the state was. I was really, really new. I'd been a House member for two years. Diane asked me to lunch. She said, how can I help you, Kirsten? What would be most useful for you, for me to do for you? And I said, well, can you just tell me a little bit about what's it like to be a senator for a state of 60 million people? I have a state of 20 million people, so it's a lot, but I'd love to hear how have you navigated the enormous job that you have? And she just went through it. She took me step by step. Everything that she did to manage her office, she would get a memo every week from her staff about where her legislation sat, what was happening, what were her bipartisan co-sponsors. She had a memo about how many calls her office had received, what the calls were about, what people wanted to talk to her about, what their concerns were. And that was extremely meaningful to me because she said, I have a copy of this memo and I will give it to you. It's very confidential. It's just for me, for my staff. 
but perhaps you can use it to model what you need from your staff every week to know if your office is working well, to make sure all the things you need your staff to be doing are happening. It was just a small thing, but it was such a big thing to me at that time in my Senate career. And every step of the way, Diane has always reached out. She's always said, just as you said, Maggie, how are you doing? How are those boys of yours? Tell me how your struggle is. I never had to raise children while being a senator. Tell me how that is. She always cared. She always bothered. She always stopped. I've had many dinners with Diane. We had dinners together with our spouses. She'd take me to her favorite restaurant in Georgetown. She would introduce me to her other favorite women who are public servants. And she always had something meaningful to talk about, a, a challenge, an issue, a crisis. One of the first dinners she wanted to talk about how the military was using nuclear weapons in a much more strategic way and changing the entire framework of what nuclear defense meant. She had that conversation with me and the then chairwoman of armed services of one of the key subcommittees in the House. She always asked, what do you think? How are you going to challenge that problem? Our most recent meeting was a glass of wine in her hideaway a week ago. We talked about what issues could we work on together. We agreed two of the biggest issues facing her state and my state were homelessness and affordable housing. And we decided we would start working on legislation together. She didn't stop working when she was here just because she had health issues. She never stopped being insightful in the Intelligence Committee, asking the right question at the right time. Diane's legacy is extraordinary. She's an icon for women's politics, first female mayor of San Francisco, first of the two women ever elected to Senate in California, There'll be a lot of speeches about her. And so I'm not going to talk about just her bio. But one of the areas where she really was a role model for me was in LGBTQ rights. She became a champion in the 60s. Sadly, she found Harvey Milk's body after he was assassinated. But she channeled that tragedy into her public service and made sure that while she was mayor of San Francisco, that she made a difference for that community in her city and in her state. During the AIDS epidemic, she helped create the global standard for AIDS health in San Francisco. When she ran for California governor and became the first woman in her state to win a major party's gubernatorial nomination, despite losing that race, she went on to run for Senate to win. And we've seen her champion all those issues for same-sex marriage, reproductive rights. She helped pass the first assault weapons ban to keep our community safe. These are all issues that I've always cared about and built on her record. If she didn't fight for those things, we wouldn't have been able to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We wouldn't have been able to make sure transgender service members can serve still in the US military. Without her hard work, we would not have been able to guarantee marriage equality at the US Supreme Court. This body is less because Diane's not here. That grace, that courage, that keen intelligence, she will be missed by me, by all our colleagues. I brought the last gift Diane gave to me. 
Beautiful pencil drawing. Again, just part of her kindness. And I'm wearing Diane Feinstein's famous red lipstick. I yield the floor.
President. Senator from Nevada is recognized. Mr. President, I ask for unanimous consent that I be able to display this poster today on the floor. Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, like so many this morning, um, I rise to mourn the loss of a, a true champion in the United States Senate. Diane was one of the kindest, most thoughtful people um, that I have had the pleasure to know. When I first got to the Senate, and I've heard some of my colleagues this morning talk about as new senators, um, she was so gracious. As a new senator, uh, she would invite me to dinner uh, with colleagues, and she was such a lady and so professional and so elegant. Every time you went to dinner with Diane, you can be guaranteed that she would have a little set of flowers for you in your place at the restaurant, and then she would have a little parting gift for you, whether it was like a little coin purse or something to show just truly who she was. And I've heard this morning from my colleagues uh, similarly the stories of Diane's kindness and her respect for others. She was a fighter her whole life, leading on so many important issues. Uh, in the coming days and weeks and months and years as people around the world really honor Diane's memory, many will speak to her leadership, and rightfully so, uh, on women's rights and foreign affairs. But I, I want to take the time to highlight a place where Diane did so much and most people don't know unless you're a part of Team Tahoe. Diane loved Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe is the beautiful, pristine alpine lake that both Nevada and California share. And in 1997, Diane and then Senator Harry Reid got together, passed legislation to protect this pristine lake. And since that time, once a year, Diane has been instrumental in bringing people around the lake together to address the needs for Lake Tahoe. That was all Diane. So when I first got to the Senate in 1997, one of the first things we talked about, she pulled me aside and said, we're going to have the Tahoe Summit this year. I hope you're there, and I hope that you will be there always to support Tahoe. And I said, Diane, I grew up around this lake. First time I was there was when I was 18 years old. My mother grew up around this lake. We love Lake Tahoe in Nevada, and you can guarantee that I will always be there for it. And if you sat and talked to Diane, the first thing you will hear her talk about in Lake Tahoe are her memories. Her memories of riding her bike as a young girl around the lake. Her memories of times when she was there with her family, having the opportunity to enjoy this incredible Lake Tahoe. So I couldn't pass this day without recognizing, of course, all of the incredible things Diane has done. But what most people don't know, unless you're part of Nevada and California, is the hard work that she has done around this lake for the people who live there, for the people who cherish this lake, for the tourists that come there every single day. And it's not just the work that she's done here in the Senate. Uh, and this is 2017. This is the first opportunity that I had as a young senator to join Diane. And as you can see, Diane was hosting it that summer, the Lake Tahoe Summit. But Diane had this ability not only to have this summit once, once a year to talk about how we protect this lake, but she brought together incredible, incredible stakeholders and experts around the lake, people who lived there, people who worked in our states, to address not just the quality of the lake and the pristineness to protect it, but everything else around it, from the transportation side to the wildfires that were happening to the environment. And she had a luncheon, a regular luncheon, after the Tahoe Summit to talk about how we continue that work together. And because of Diane's prestige, she had the ability to bring incredible speakers to the Tahoe Summit once a year. First, President Clinton, then one time, President Obama. Just recently, uh, we had our um, uh, former speaker, Speaker Emeritus, uh, Nancy Pelosi, speaking. Uh, we had one of our incredible senators, chairwoman of Energy and Natural Resources at the time, Lisa Murkowski. Because it was about how we work across party lines to really focus on protecting for everyone who wants to enjoy this Lake Tahoe. 
She was a true champion, and she will be missed. And I, on behalf of Team Tahoe, which is what she coined it, Diane never took credit for anything she did around this lake. Even though people wanted to recognize her and show that support, she never took the credit. She said, this is about a team. This is Team Tahoe. This is what we do together. This is how we work together. And this is the legacy of her work in the United States Senate, carried forward right here in Lake Tahoe. So to Diane, to her family, her incredible family, to everyone on Team Tahoe, uh, I, we will miss Diane Feinstein. She will always be a part of the work that we do. Her legacy will live on, not just around Tahoe, but so many other areas uh, as we have talked about today. But I am going to miss her. I am going to miss the opportunity to sit with her at lunch and talk about what we still need to do to fight to protect this incredible, pristine lake. Thank you, Diane, for your service. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Morning business is closed. Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of H.R. 3935, which the clerk will report. Calendar number 211, H.R. 3935, an act to amend Title 49, United States Code, and so forth, and for other purposes.
Mr. President. The senator from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. And we are not in a quorum call, correct? We are not. Thank you, Mr. President. I join my colleagues on the floor this morning to pay tribute to Senator Feinstein and to remember her warmth, her generosity, her kindness, and the way she really loved to elevate women. It didn't matter what your party was. It didn't matter um, where you came from. When you achieved, she loved to recognize that. And as I came to the Senate from the House and being the first female from Tennessee to serve in the U.S. Senate, she talked about the likeness of that experience for her as breaking barriers and being the first mayor, female mayor of San Francisco and being the first woman from California to hold a seat in the U.S. Senate. So I always appreciated that she pushed forward with elevating women and encouraging women. And of course, as we all know, she loved to gather the women of the Senate together for dinner or for a photo to make certain that we recorded our games here in the Senate and that we had a place to share our stories of what we were experiencing because we all know there were times that she had incurred um, different unkind words from people who thought that she should not be in that position. So we appreciated that of her. I really enjoyed the opportunity to work with her at Senate Judiciary Committee. And she and I spent quite a bit of time working on issues that pertain to our nation's creative community. This was a community that she truly celebrated she loved the fact that people could create a song out of a thought or a few words that they heard. And we worked together to protect those rights of entertainers and to make certain that um, as we worked on the HITS Act, as we worked on intellectual property uh, issues, that our innovators, and our creators were going to have that constitutional right protected to benefit from those creations. Um, we all know, and I know many of my colleagues have mentioned today, her fondness for the Senate and for the institution. We will remember that as we wish uh, her family well and wish them protection during this time of loss and sadness. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin.
Mr. President. The Senator from Delaware is recognized. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that proceedings under the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Mr. President, I come to the floor this morning to reflect on and remember a dear friend and colleague, someone who served this nation in this body for 30 years, someone who's already been remembered by many others as a trailblazer, someone who left a lasting mark on this Senate, on her state of California, on our nation. When I first came to this Senate now 13 years ago, Senator Feinstein was someone whose career I had long followed and long admired. She was elected to this body when I was a law student in the year of the woman, when following a contentious hearing, there was a concerted effort made to recruit some of the strongest, most capable potential candidates to join this body, and Senator Feinstein was certainly among those incredible leaders. I had the honor, the blessing of being in small rooms in negotiations with her within my first few years and saw behind the scenes what anyone who followed her publicly got to know about Senator Feinstein. She was tough. She was fierce. She was determined. She was prepared. She had always done the reading. She studied the details of every bill, every piece of legislation, everything we voted on. When I had the chance to join the Appropriations Committee, and I approached her once here on the floor to ask her consent to amend the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee bill. She was floor managing. She turned, stopped, and said, are you asking my permission to file an amendment to my bill? And somewhat haltingly, being still a very junior senator, I said, yes, yes, ma'am, that is exactly what I'm doing. And she smiled and laughed and said, oh, aren't you nice? And I said, doesn't every senator ask your permission before they attempt to amend your bill? She goes, no, they no longer do, but they should. She was always dressed to the nines. She was always gracious and dignified. She exuded a quiet power that in critical moments in the history of this institution and our nation, our country and world got to see. As the chair of the Intelligence Committee determined to make public a tectonic struggle between this body and its role and the history of interrogation techniques that she and many of us concluded were inappropriate and broke the boundaries, determined to defend the prerogatives of the Senate, even in a very difficult and charged environment. Given her early experience in San Francisco and the tragedy that brought her from council president to mayor, she was a focused, persistent, effective advocate for gun safety. My friend and predecessor in this seat, now our president, President Joe Biden, served alongside Senator Feinstein for many, many years. And together, they worked hard to advance the Violence Against Women Act, the assault weapons ban, and dozens of other pieces of important legislation to help make our country more equitable, more inclusive, safer, and more just. I was reflecting this morning when I got the hard news about Diane's passing last night. On the very first time I met her, I was a young man. I was just a year out of law school, and I was living and working in New York City for the I Have a Dream Foundation. And I happened to have a car. And a friend who I think was working for Mayor Dinkins called and asked if I would drive out to Teterboro Airport and pick up Senator Feinstein of California. I couldn't believe my luck as a young man in his early 20s to get a chance to speak for even a moment or two to a U.S. Senator. Well, I drove out there and was sure to be on time and waited diligently and had been told by some of the campaign staff to not expect that she would even speak to me. She insisted on sitting in the front seat next to me. And we chatted for almost an hour and a half as we made our way back into downtown Manhattan in heavy traffic. And I had the chance to listen to then new Senator Feinstein talk about her experience as mayor, make observations about how the city of New York was being run and what the issues were, and then to ask her a few questions about public service, about what motivated her, about why she worked so hard. As a very young man, that experience, that conversation stayed with me for years. And when I first came to this body and had a chance to sit near her on this floor and to serve 
down the dais from her on judiciary, I approached and repeated that story. And she said, young man, what I want you to remember is that every time you have a chance, whether with a page or an intern, with a campaign volunteer, you also have the opportunity and the obligation to remind them who we serve and why we serve. Senator Feinstein was a giant here. She showed what public service means. She was determined. She was capable. She was dedicated. Her last vote was yesterday. And I cannot imagine the loss that her family and staff are feeling, the enormous gap this will leave for the state of California and for this institution today and into the future as we mark, as we mourn the passing of this incredible trailblazer, and as we prayerfully reflect on her incredible legacy. Thank you, Diane, for your decades of loyal and loving service to this, our great nation. Thank you, Mr. President. With that, I suggest the absence of a quorum. We'll call the roll. Ms. Baldwin.
President. I'm over here, so. yeah. Senator from Connecticut is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I ask that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. And that I be permitted to complete my remarks prior to the scheduled vote. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I join my colleagues in mourning the passing of a great and good colleague. Someone we knew not only as a fellow worker here and a colleague, but also as a friend. Every one of us had a personal connection to Diane Feinstein. She had no enemies. She had adversaries. She differed, but she could differ and disagree without being disagreeable, as the saying goes. And she established personal connections with all of us over her many years of service. I've listened to my colleagues on the floor this morning, and coming through to me is not only a sense of pain in her passing, but also joy in knowing her. And what strikes me is that she leaves a legacy, yes, a legacy in legislation, in good works in California that impacted people's lives there, but her real legacy is people. Her legacy is the people who regard her as a role model, the people who were inspired to follow her into public service, the people who stood up and spoke out, and often it was truth to power, as she did, because she was there, she blazed the trail, she showed how to do it. I first became aware of Dianne Feinstein in the early 1990s as a newly elected state attorney general advocating for an assault weapons ban in the state of Connecticut, the early 1990s, and she was doing it at the federal level. Connecticut and the Congress, did it together. And then I defended our Connecticut law in the Connecticut courts against many of the same arguments that were used to challenge the federal law. She stood alone in those days as an advocate and a champion of gun violence prevention. And she modeled the courage that has led to the modern movement of gun violence Prevention. And it is a movement now because she knew it would require the American people to be as outraged as she was and saddened by the death that she personally witnessed in San Francisco. And she would often recall it in very personal terms. For her, all of these causes were personal. Her service and her helping people were personal. And she understood that service and results, accomplishments, required that we be bipartisan, that we work across the aisle, that we work with people who disagreed with us and try to find common ground. That's what she did relentlessly and tirelessly. So her service, her grace, her generosity, her sensitivity, her caring will continue in the people that are her legacy, in the people who will and should always preserve her memory as a motivation for continued service. I'm proud to have been her friend as well as her colleague. And I will always treasure the great and good model and mentorship that she provided for so many of us as we go through these next days of grief and pain, but also joy in knowing her. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.
Under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the following nomination, which the clerk will report. Nomination, Department of Justice, Todd Gee of the District of Columbia to be United States Attorney for the Southern District of Mississippi. Under the previous order, the question is on the nomination. Is there a sufficient second? The yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun. Mrs. Britt, Mr. Brown. Mr. Bud. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz. Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, see the double check. Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley. Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan, Ms. Lummis, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Risch, 
Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warnock, Ms. Warren, Mr. Welch, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative, Blumenthal, Coons, Grassley, Kane, Lujan, Murphy, Peters, Welch, and Wicker. Mr. Warner, aye. No senator voted in the negative. Mr. Van Hall and I. Mrs. Hyde Smith, I. Ms. Rosen, aye. Ms. Hass and I. Mrs. Murray, aye.
Ms. Duckworth, aye. Ms. Lummis, aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. King, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Tuberville, aye. Mr. Graham, aye. Ms. 
Mr. Mullen, no. Mr. Mullen, I. Mr. Paul, no. Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Scott of Florida, no. Mr. Heinrich, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Fetterman, aye. Mr. Schmidt, no.
Mr. Tester, aye. Mr. Padilla, aye. Mr. Brown, aye. Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Booker, aye. Mr. Carper, aye. Mr. Risch, aye. Ms. Warren, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Who? Mr. Schumer, aye. Mr. Warnock, aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Ricketts, aye.
Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Kelly, aye. Mr. McConnell, aye. Mrs. Fisher, aye.
Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Cruz, no. Mr. Crapo, aye. Ms. Cantwell, aye. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Hove and I. Mr. Ossoff. I. Did you just? Mr. Shot's eye. Mr. Brasso, aye. Mr. Bud, aye.
Mr. Tillisai. Mrs. Britt, no. Mr. Young, aye. Mr. Vance, no. Mr. Johnson, no. Mr. Cardin, aye. Mr. Hickenlooper, aye. Mr. Vance, aye. Mr. Lankford, aye. Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Romney, aye. Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Haggerty, no.
Ms. Hirono, aye. Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Braun, no. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Haggerty, aye. Ms. Cortez Masto, aye. Mr. Corn and I. Mr. Hawley, no. Mr. Wyden, aye. Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Ms.
Mr. Reed, aye. Mr. Lee, aye. Ms. Cinema, I. Mr. Menendez, aye.
Mr. Thunai. Ms. Ernst, I. Yep. On this vote, the yeas are 82, the nays are 8, and the nomination is confirmed. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table, and the President will be immediately notified of the Senate's action. The clerk will report the McGrath nomination. Nomination, Department of Justice, Tara K. McGrath of California to be United States Attorney for the Southern District of California. Under the previous order, the question is on the nomination. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mrs. Britt, Mr. Brown, Mr. Budd, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins. Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Dane, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst. Mr. Fetterman. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley.
Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Hickenlooper. Mr. Rono. Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan, Ms. Lummis. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Markley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Risch, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance. 